Over the weekend, we saw the sale of Credit Suisse to UBS in probably the most dramatic moment in global banking since the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. And as I discussed in my most recent video, Credit Suisse has been the problem child of European banking for quite some time now. It's been plagued by scandals, losses, management shakeups, and restructuring plans. They've been involved in every scandal of the last decade, always managing to lose money. The bank was sold for $3.2 billion in an all-stock deal, meaning that shareholders were paid in shares of UBS rather than in cash. This represents a huge discount to the firm's prior market value. The Swiss government additionally guaranteed just under $10 billion of the joint entity's losses that it may suffer on certain portfolios of assets. Controversially, the Swiss regulator FINMA demanded that $17.3 billion of Credit Suisse's additional Tier 1 or AT1 bonds be written off, meaning that these debt holders did worse than stockholders, which has surprised quite a few investors. My video on Friday wrapped up by saying that a sale to UBS was a distinct possibility, and that was exactly what ended up happening. So today let's discuss the events that occurred over the weekend, focusing in on the different treatment of equity investors and AT1 bondholders, whose wipeout is one of the more controversial elements of the deal. We'll also look at who the largest holders of these bonds were and what they have to say about the deal. So backing up a bit, the important piece of news that was not out there last week was that on Wednesday the Swiss National Bank, the Swiss regulator FINMA and the Swiss Minister of Finance called the senior management of Credit Suisse. They authorized the $54 billion backstop that we all knew about, but they delivered an additional message that day that Credit Suisse would have to merge with UBS and that the deal would need to be worked out before Asian markets opened after the weekend on Monday morning. This was not optional, a person briefed on the conversation told the Financial Times. So at the very time that the Swiss regulators were telling the market that everything was fine at Credit Suisse, they were telling Credit Suisse that the game was over. Before we go through the series of events, let me quickly tell you about today's video sponsor, The Daily Upside. If you find yourself sifting through multiple news sources, trying to find unbiased and insightful news, The Daily Upside might be the solution to your problem. It's a totally free daily email newsletter written by a team of financial professionals with real industry experience and is now read by a million investors every day. It's become the first thing I read every morning as it's informative, entertaining and not dumbed down. They give you the most important news with real analysis. Their coverage of the situation at Credit Suisse has been extremely helpful in researching this video. Whether you're a financial professional or just looking for a great source of business news, the Daily Upside will help. It's totally free to sign up and they send you one information-filled email every morning. I can't recommend it enough. Sign up using the link in the description below. Okay, so global markets were quite nervous last week as three US banks had just gone under and more than $10 billion of wealthy clients' money was being pulled out of Credit Suisse every day. This added to the huge client withdrawals that had occurred during the last quarter of 2022 after rumors had spread on social media in October that the firm was on the verge of bankruptcy. Colm Kelleher, the chairman of UBS, was called in by the Swiss regulators that Wednesday and ordered to find a solution to save Credit Suisse. The other option of a government-controlled wind-down was neither attractive to the regulators or to the team at UBS, as there were risks of contagion and a further tarnishing of the reputation of Swiss banks globally. 
As I mentioned in my last video, a merger like this between Switzerland's two largest banks had been discussed for quite some time, but the main impediment was antitrust regulations. Until last Wednesday, it was believed that the Swiss regulators were committed to a two-bank model no matter what. During the credit crunch, the government had stepped in to rescue UBS using taxpayer money after it had suffered huge losses. They did this rather than allow the bank to be acquired. According to news reports, there was almost no direct contact between teams at the two banks while the deal was being negotiated. UBS was clear from the very start that they would only participate in the deal if it was cheaply priced and if UBS could be indemnified from any of the legal issues that Credit Suisse was potentially facing, which was probably a good idea. By Friday, the pace of customer withdrawals from Credit Suisse was picking up and international banks were starting to cut ties with the firm. The regulators decided that without a deal occurring over the weekend, the bank was unlikely to open on Monday morning. A team from the New York-based investment company BlackRock flew to Zurich too on Friday to discuss a variety of options including a partial acquisition or a wealth management partnership. But according to the FT, the deals that were being pitched by BlackRock were unattractive to the Swiss regulators. A Chinese blockchain entrepreneur named Justin Sun apparently tweeted his interest in buying Credit Suisse and transforming it into a crypto-friendly bank, possibly because so many of those have disappeared lately. I don't believe that Swiss regulators have replied to his Twitter thread yet, and that's just because banking deals aren't traditionally struck over Twitter. It's usually a little bit more formal than that. He does have one of those $8 blue ticks though, so it's probably a legitimate offer, but anyhow. By late Friday, BlackRock had walked away. A cross-border deal would have been more complicated than the one with UBS, as US regulators would have needed to get involved too. Negotiations between UBS and the regulators continued all day Saturday. Late in the day, the UBS team delivered a document offering $1 billion in stock for the whole group, which included a break clause for UBS linked to credit default swap spreads. This price was well below what the company had traded for on Friday's close. The CDS provision would have likely killed the deal anyway once it was announced. Credit Suisse refused to sign this deal, and their Middle Eastern investors, who had essentially sparked the panic, were furious. Saudi National Bank urged Credit Suisse to reject the offer, and calls went out from Credit Suisse to various institutions, including Deutsche Bank, in a last-ditch effort to find an alternative. The complexity of the transaction and the short time frame meant that there were no takers. The Swiss government threatened to remove the Credit Suisse board if they couldn't strike a deal and announced that they would introduce emergency legislation to strip the shareholders of both Credit Suisse and UBS of the right to vote on any deal. The regulators pushed UBS to increase their price, ramping up pressure on both sides. UBS came back with an offer of $3.25 billion in stock, but if they were going to pay this price, they wanted more support from the government, including a 100 billion Swiss franc liquidity line from the Swiss National Bank and a government loss guarantee of up to 9 billion Swiss francs after UBS had borne the first 5 billion Swiss franc loss itself. Time was running out and the team at Credit Suisse were still furious about how things were working out. At this point, both sides had not really even sat down together, despite their offices essentially facing each other across a square in Zurich. 
The Swiss government made one additional tweak to the deal so that it would be more palatable for Swiss citizens and the bank's equity investors. They decided to impose just over $17 billion worth of losses on Credit Suisse's additional Tier 1 or AT1 capital bonds. These are a type of bond that was introduced in the wake of the credit crunch that are designed to take losses when financial institutions run into trouble. Normally, they're not triggered if shareholders receive money as part of a takeover, but the bond documentation in this case specifically states that a write-down may occur even if existing preference shares, participation certificates, and ordinary shares of Credit Suisse Group remain outstanding. Here is a chart of those bonds. They went to zero. The fact that this provision existed in the bond contract allowed Swiss authorities to disregard the normal order of priority, and they likely chose to do so to save some face with international equity holders after denying them a vote on the transaction, particularly the investors from the Middle East, which is an important customer base for both banks' wealth management operations. Credit Suisse's board went through the final contract and, after consulting with their advisors, signed the deal. A press conference was quickly pulled together. This is no bailout, the Swiss finance minister said. This is a commercial solution. She went on to say the failure of a systemically relevant bank would have had severe repercussions and Switzerland needs to be aware of its responsibility beyond its own borders. Axel Lehmann, the chair of Credit Suisse, said that Given recent extraordinary and unprecedented circumstances, the announced merger represents the best available outcome. Kelleher from UBS said that it was a historic day that he had hoped would never come, and that while the acquisition is attractive for UBS shareholders, he wanted to be clear that as far as Credit Suisse is concerned, this is an emergency rescue. The combined bank that will result from this transaction will be huge for Switzerland. Its assets come to roughly twice the size of the Swiss economy. If each individual bank was deemed too big to fail, the new entity will be of even greater systemic importance. UBS will have a huge market share in Switzerland, giving it a near monopoly in the country. Antitrust measures were waived to get the deal done quickly, and you have to wonder if this domestic monopoly will cause problems for Swiss bank customers, or if the new entity will be slowly broken up in the coming years. UBS will have to make sure that its capital ratios are high enough to support the new, much larger bank. They announced after the deal that the bank remains capitalized well above its target of 13%. Swiss regulators announced that the takeover will result in a larger bank, for which the current regulations require higher capital buffers, but they will grant appropriate transitional periods for these to be built up. The Swiss government has, of course, come under attack from bondholders and international regulators for its handling of this shotgun wedding. The decision to favour shareholders at the expense of bondholders raised many eyebrows with investors in similar bonds issued by other banks, worrying that they too could be sacrificed in a similar scenario in the future. 81 bonds issued by other European banks sold off sharply after the announcement. In deals like this, shareholders of the selling bank often do get paid something, not necessarily because their shares have any significant value, but because the deal is technically supposed to be voluntary, and it's difficult for the board of directors of the selling company to announce that they negotiated the best possible price for shareholders and got nothing for them, not even a Toblerone. Okay, so let's go over the AT1 bonds. What are they, and is what happened to bondholders fair? 
Well, in the wake of the credit crunch, regulators wanted to transfer more of the risk of a systemic bank failure away from depositors and taxpayers and onto the bondholders. Issuing securities like these was seen as a way of strengthening bank balance sheets and reducing the need for taxpayer-funded bailouts in the future. The way these bonds work is that they are perpetual bonds with a fixed face value and they make regular interest payments. Being perpetuities, the bank doesn't have to pay back the principal amount ever, but they can after five years, and they generally do. If the bank's common equity tier one capital ratio ever falls below 7%, then the AT1 bond gets written down to zero. It disappears, and this improves the balance sheet of the bank as a big chunk of debt has just vaporized. Now, AT1 bonds don't all work this way. Some convert into common stock when the trigger is hit. Others are temporarily written down and stop paying interest when the trigger is hit, but then they can bounce back if the equity recovers. Each contract, though, is different. Some investors feel that these bonds should have been senior to equity, but they're just not. It's right there in their name. 7% CET1 trigger write down AT1 bonds. That name means that if the bank's common equity tier one capital ratio ever falls below 7%, the bonds are written down. It's written in the bond prospectus too, which can easily be found on the Credit Suisse website. This structure has not been hidden in any way. Some investors just chose to ignore it. Here's a slide from a presentation on Credit Suisse's capital structure, and you can see that low trigger AT1s are lower in the capital structure than equity capital is. Now, there's not just this automatic trigger that writes the bonds down to zero. These particular bonds can also be zeroed by the regulator. Once again, this is not the case for all AT1 bonds, but it is the case for these bonds. Credit Suisse issued an AT1 bond with a yield of 9.75% last year, when rates were a lot lower than they are right now. And that 9.75% coupon compensates investors for the risk that they're taking in buying a bond like this. If these bonds were the same as regular Credit Suisse bonds, they would have had much lower yields. The bonds documentation does state that the Swiss regulators may not be required to follow any order of priority, which means, amongst other things, that the notes could be cancelled in whole or in part prior to the cancellation of any or all of Credit Suisse Group's equity capital. The prospectus included a clause saying that the bonds could be written down in a viability event, which can include a situation where the bank has received an irrevocable commitment of extraordinary support from the public sector. Some of the owners of these bonds, or similar ones, may have been senior management and employees at Credit Suisse. In the wake of the financial crisis, regulators pushed banks to better align pay with risk-taking. Big cash bonuses, they felt, encouraged traders and executives to make big bets without any regard for the long-term consequences. Credit Suisse paid a significant portion of bankers' bonuses in this type of bond, tying the money up for a number of years before it vested, putting traders and management on the hook for any catastrophic failure that might occur. We don't yet know if the employee bonds were zeroed or not during this transaction. It hasn't been discussed, but it would be pretty controversial if bondholders got zeroed and employees did not, so you can assume they probably did. I'm sure that'll all come out over the next few days. The situation at Credit Suisse fulfilled many of the regulators' ambitions. About $17 billion in AT1 bonds were wiped out as part of the sale to UBS, essentially reducing the debt burden on the firm's new owner, UBS, and possibly hitting risk-taking employees and bond investors who willingly bought these securities. During the credit crunch, 
bondholders were protected from losses at all costs, as regulators worried that bond investors being wiped out could cause contagion. This was particularly controversial in Ireland, where the government guaranteed all bank bondholders at the taxpayer's expense. If bondholders can never be allowed to lose, it leads us to the question of why do they get paid a credit spread if there's no actual risk of loss? The real controversy around the decision does relate to the fact that bondholders were treated more harshly than shareholders. This has rippled across the broader $260 billion AT1 market and is the biggest test to date of a regulatory framework that has until now been mostly untested. Other regulators, including the European Central Bank, have over the last few days stressed that they would not follow and would not have followed the Swiss method in resolving a failing bank in their jurisdiction. The bond market jitters led the chair of the Single Resolution Board, which is the body in charge of shutting down failed banks in Europe, along with the European Banking Authority and the European Central Bank, to put out a statement stressing that common equity instruments would continue to be the first ones to absorb losses, with 81 bonds being written down only afterwards. The Bank of England made a similar announcement. Swiss investors have announced that they are considering legal action over the government's use of emergency measures that meant shareholders did not get a vote on the merger transaction. Ethos Foundation, which speaks on behalf of pension funds and other institutional investors that own up to 5% of both banks, said that the takeover was a huge waste for the shareholders and the Swiss economy. So other than some Credit Suisse employees who will have been partially paid with these bonds, who else owned them? Well, retail investors typically don't own bonds like these, other than possibly through a fund they may have invested in. Retail investors are prohibited from buying bonds like these in many jurisdictions like the UK, as they would be unlikely to understand the risks. PIMCO, Invesco and Leg Mason are among the top holders of Credit Suisse's AT1 bonds, according to Bloomberg data. The Financial Times reports that this type of debt is quite popular with investors in Asia who appreciated the brand names of the issuers and the yields available. The Credit Suisse bond issued last year paying a 9.75% coupon was particularly popular according to the report. The FT says that many investors in Asia bought the AT1s using borrowed money and were receiving margin calls on Monday. Asian private bank clients reportedly led AT1 bond selling this week where some panicked sellers pushed down AT1s issued by banks in Asia by between 2 and 10 points depending on the country. If you found today's video interesting, you should watch this one next. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, The Daily Upside, using the link in the description below. Have a great day and see you in the next video. Bye.